Welcome everybody. I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the Director of Programs at China Institute, and we are so delighted to have you join us this morning for what's going to be a very important conversation, I think. We're talking about a very important topic this morning, um, but one about which the public really knows very little, and that is sovereign funds. Uh, how they're shaping investment markets, and also in some ways remaking the geopolitical map. Um, and yet we read very little about them. So we have two wonderful speakers, experts joining us this morning to help us understand them. Um, and then we will they will do a presentation and then we will have a Q&A section at the end. So if you have any questions, please do type them into the Q&A section and um, we will try to get to them at the end. So. Our two speakers this morning, let me just introduce them to you. We have Paul Downs, who is a practiced in who has practiced international law for more than four decades, and most recently as a partner at Hogan Lovells in New York, where he co-founded the Sovereign Investor Practice and initiated its annual Sovereign Investor Conference. So Paul's been working on sovereign funds, the sovereign funds issue for a very long time and knows very well how they work. Uh, Winston Ma is an investor an attorney, an author, and an adjunct, adjunct professor in the global digital economy. Most recently for 10 years, uh, Winston was the managing director and head of North America office for China Investment Corporation, CIC, which is of course China's sovereign wealth fund. So Winston knows um, about sovereign wealth funds from the inside, from behind the scenes, and in particular can bring insights to China's strategy uh, in terms of how it runs its uh, sovereign fund. Uh, most importantly for today, the two of them have a new book, which is called The Hunt for Unicorns, How Sovereign Funds Are Reshaping Investment in the digital economy. So they've been tracking this for decades and most recently have done a deep dive on the subject. Uh, and so they are real experts. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Winston and he's gonna do a presentation followed by, uh, uh, um, yes, exactly. Winston's gonna do start the presentation followed by Paul and uh, then we'll have a conversation. Thanks, over to you, Winston. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dinda. And I guess uh, uh, the audience can see the uh, presentation PowerPoint now. Yes, Aaron's going to bring it up. Yep. That, that's that's great. Yes. Yeah, so so this is the uh, the cover cover page of the uh, of the book. You know, the hunt for unicorns. Now, just quick definition, right? Unicorn in for tech investing means private startups that has a valuation of more than one billion dollars, uh, and that's a big, huge milestone for startups. But the sovereign funds are changing the game and they are not only hunt for the unicorns but also they are feeding the unicorns and they are also uh, making the unicorns and that's really uh, our presentation today so next slide please to put today's discussion into context uh, here's a very quick question who holds the power in financial markets for many the answer would probably be the large investment banks like morgan stanley and goldman sachs or big asset managers like Blackstone and BlackRock, or hedge funds like Bridgewater, right? Because they're often in the media's spotlight. But a new group of sovereign wealth funds, sovereign funds, let's say, uh, which includes the, the world's largest sovereign wealth funds, SWF, uh, that's what people are most familiar with. And also uh, some of the large government pension funds, uh, plus the reserve funds of central banks of different countries. You know, these group, these players are forming this group we refer to as the sovereign investment funds. Uh, because they are estimated to have $30 trillion in assets under management and have enormous power in the financial world. Uh, we also refer to them as the trillion dollar club in our book. Next slide. Now, First, let's look at some of the biggest players, you know, the, the leading sovereign wealth funds. The, this is the, the list of the top 10 sovereign funds. Uh, the largest one is, interestingly, from Norway, uh, based on their uh, national oil reserve. Uh, this oil, you know, for, for these quote unquote oil funds, that also includes the idea of UAE and also the PIF, PIF of uh, Saudi or of the Qatar Investment Authority. You know, lots of the Middle East guys. Now, the, another group of this list uh, are Eastern Asian 
countries, uh, the most notably, you know, China. China actually has three sovereign funds and they are all uh, top 10. You know, uh, China Investment Corporation is about $1 trillion uh, is where I used to work at. Uh, and also there is the uh, central bank's uh, investment arm, SAFE, you know, state administration of foreign exchange. Now here uh, it only listed their uh, portfolio investments, but if you include SAFE's investments in the US treasuries, which is more than $1 trillion, you know, they are actually, they can be viewed as the largest because they have like more than $2 trillion to manage, um, which is the lion's share of the $3 trillion foreign reserve of China. And uh, besides of CIC and SAFE, you know, the third sovereign fund of China uh, is the National Council for Social Security Fund. It manages the pension money for the country. Uh, next slide. Now, the, uh, then, uh, as we mentioned, right, uh, previous, please, Aaron. As we mentioned, uh, uh, another group within the sovereign investment funds are the government pension funds here, right? Here, we also listed the, the top 10 here. Uh, very interestingly, uh, is that the US Social Security Trust Fund, more than, you know, more than $3 trillion uh, is the number one. But a lot of times people think the government Pension Fund of Japan, which has about $1.5 trillion uh, is, is the uh, biggest one. Uh, and then the US also has the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board. Uh, uh, but most of the time people hear about the Canadian pension funds, right? And, and the more well-known US pension fund, if you will, is, is, the, is the more smaller California public pension fund, which often ref referred to as CalPERS, which runs about 400 million, 400 million uh, uh, assets. Next slide. Yeah, so when we look at you know, the previous two, two slides, someone may have this question, like why we never heard of, for example, uh, US uh, thrift savings fund or, uh, or social security fund in the deal making market. You know, we never read about their activities in the Wall Street Journal, right? Instead, we keep hearing about the Canadian pension funds. And I said, you know, the, 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 the answer is in their different investment strategies or even uh, let's call it investment culture. Uh, basically, it's about active investment versus passive investments. You know, if we think about in the historical context, the, the pension funds and the sovereign funds as a group used to be very passive investors. They put money into the hands of the professional asset managers and they, they focus on the return instead of getting to the investments directly. You know, that's, that's, that's the past. But in recent years, uh, more and more sovereign funds are becoming active direct investors. And that's why their, their active involvement in the tech investments these years become such a headline. Uh, so, okay, so here's a little bit of uh, evolution of the behavior of this trillion dollar club. You know, at the, at the very beginning, the first step was they were passive investors, right? At the top, as, acting as limited partners. They put money into venture fund and the venture fund is managed by the fund GP, the general partners team. Uh, the, the venture fund may invest into a group of portfolio companies, uh, but the sovereign investors do not deal with the companies directly because the, GM, the, the, the GP manager deals with them directly. And then the second step was as they wanted to learn about direct investing themselves to save the money, to save the manual fee paid to Blackstone or Bridgewater, they say, okay, we, we, let's co-investing into something uh, so this is on the right side of this chart, right? You know, for portfolio three, the sovereign investor, they put additional money uh, into the into portfolio investment three, acting as a direct shareholder. And in this way, you know, they can co-investing with the GP and they learn about the right investing and, and develop their internal investing capabilities. And that's, that, that leads to the third phase, which is more and more sovereign funds that become direct investors. You know, they say, forget about the venture fund. We can talk to the companies themselves. We can bring value to them. Let's invest in them directly. And that's really what makes uh, today's investment world interesting. Next slide. 
So when, when, when did this uh, trend happen in big time? Interestingly, it was the last global financial crisis, 2007, 2008. During that time, the US financial institutions were in crisis and they needed capital. And where do they call? It's mostly Asia and the Middle East. So for example, in, in the case of Citibank, it took more than 10 billions from different sovereign wealth funds. That includes the KI of Kuwait, RD of UAE, and the two Singapore sovereign funds, you know, uh, GIC, the Government Investment Corporation, and the famous Tamasic, right? another sovereign fund of Singapore. Next slide. And at that time, CIC also put money into the uh, financial service sector in the US in a similar theme. You know, it, it started with $3 billion into Blackstone's IPO, and then in 2008, put uh, about $7 billion alone into the troubled Morgan Stanley. And, and that was also the time I left Wall Street Journal, uh, left Wall Street as a, as, as a Wall Street lawyer and banker and, and joined the CIC at its beginning. You know, it, it was a really interesting, exciting time because on one side, you know, it, 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 CIC was a new establishment. So it was, for me, it was the first encounter with the sovereign investment world. Uh, you know, at the same time, it, it, it was also the first time that the sovereign funds in general become direct powerful entrant into the capital markets because they put uh, an enormous amount of capital into the Wall Street, right? And what's, 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 what, 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 what's behind this is it, it's the evolution of the sovereign funds that are investing. You know, as, as the financial institutions themselves, certainly they started direct investing in areas they are familiar with, which, which is the financial sector. So 2008 uh, was a uh, interesting, was a good opportunity for them to, 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 to practice that, right? And, and 10 years from that, it, we, we, we see uh, the sovereign funds are going into all different sectors because they have developed expertise in almost all sectors. And the tech investing is a frontier field. Next slide. Yeah. So. So fast forward to, to today, the sovereign funds are the new venture capitalists in the digital economy. And the, the most prominent example of this, obviously, is the Vision Fund, because two sovereign funds, you know, uh, the, the, the PIF of Saudi Arabia and the Mubadala of UAE put more than $60 billion into Vision Fund, which is managed by the SoftBank, right? The famous uh, Masayoshi Sun, um, you know, to, 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 to put this into context in you know, helping you to understand how this changed, changed the, 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 the game rule of, of VC in Silicon Valley, just to think about the numbers, right? You know, we are you're talking about a $100 billion vision fund. And at the same time, for average VC fund in Silicon Valley and across the world is about 100 million or even less. So you were talking about a VC fund that's more than 1,000 times bigger, right? Um, so so the, it, it changed the game. You know, they certainly, you know, Vision Fund hunts for Unicorn, but, it, you know, because they write a so big check to the startups, they're also the Vision, they're also the, the un, Unicorn make, makers. Uh, so for example, yesterday, DoorDash, right, the food delivery company uh, went to public. It, one of its main investor is Vision Fund, you know, it, in four times, in, in four times, it collectively invested in more than 600 million to the company. So of course, the company is a unicorn, more than one, one billion valuation. But you know, it also brought a, a huge return to the Vision Fund. You know, based on yesterday's IPO price, uh, the total position is more than 11 billion by now. So, so it's a totally different kind of investment compared to traditional VC investment of $3, three million dollars into a startup and then you know getting getting a multiple times return it's a very different kind of story next slide now uh, another very interesting example is the ant group in china right uh, it, it's the uh, financial arm of alibaba uh, it was it, it is today it is still the largest unicorn in the world based on the 150 billion dollar valuation from the last round of private fundraising uh, in 2018. Uh, you know, its, it's main investor obviously is the Chinese sovereign funds, 
both CIC and the National Social Security Fund, you know, in the middle, but uh, you know, also includes the Vision Fund and also includes uh, many uh, other players uh, such as the Sovereign Funds of Malaysia and uh, Singapore and also the Canadian Pension, CPPIB. Um, it, you know, uh, if, uh, if without the, uh, the suspended IPO due to increased regulation back in November, Ant Group could become the largest IPO ever in history. So, but it, can, it still has a chance to be so. So we have to keep an eye on that. Next slide. Now, so far we have talked about the sovereign funds acting as the financial investors, right? But obviously the sovereign funds are connected to the government. So there's always this, there's this linkage with government agenda. Uh, so they are also, you, you also see so, some of the sovereign funds are set up to achieve government goals. And one best example to this is China's new semiconductor fund. You know, the, it, its main goal is to seek self-sufficient chip production, you know, to, to, to have the safety of the supply chain from US potential sanctions. Uh, the, the, current, the current Chinese semiconductor fund actually is very big. Uh, it's about $30 billion size. And it, is, it has already started making investments into the sector to drive research and uh, development. Next slide. You know, the, the, the best example of this is SMIC. Uh, Shanghai, uh, it, it, it's, it's about Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, SMIC. You know, the, in May 2020, uh, the, you know, the, the, this company is, uh, is headquartered in Shanghai, by the way. So in, in May 2020, uh, it received investment from the semiconductor fund of the country. You know, the, it's, it's called China's National Integrated Circuit Industry Investment Fund. Yeah, and at the same time, they also got the, got the um, investment from a Shanghai entity, which is called Shanghai Integrated Circuit Industry Investment Fund. Uh, we, we, you can view this as a Shanghai-based, another sovereign fund, right, for semiconductor. Uh, so these two, the, these two, two, two guys put in 1.7 billion dollars and 750 million, respectively, into uh, SMIC, into SMIC. Now, th this is obviously it's a great investment for the company, right? You know, they got to, got to more capital for R and D in this capital intensive industry. Uh, but this is you know just one side of story. Of, of, of today's topic, you know, when sovereign funds putting money into tech startups, you know, uh, in the commercial context, you know, it, 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 it's certainly a, a very useful long-term capital. But at the same time, because of the government linkage, it may have other profound implications. So here in, in the SMIC case, what we see is um, because of this linkage with the government uh, on the US side, uh, U.S. put it on the sanction list so that so that uh, it, it may have trouble to to create uh, to create that uh, tech independence, right? You, you see, you know the the, the 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 May 2020 announcement was made on the same day that the U.S. announced new restrictions on Chinese tech company Huawei Technologies. Um, when when the supply chain <clears throat> when the uh, there's a supply, component supply to Huawei is cut. SMIC is set to provide some of, some of the supply alternative, right? When they create their own chips. Uh, so, so, in, so in response, the US also cut the supply to SMIC. And the latest in September, 2020, uh, US put SMIC on sanction list that will Oh no! Actually, you know, the September 2020 was the sanction list, and the more recent in December, U.S. put SMIC uh, among four four companies to to face U.S. sanctions for deemed military ties. You know, which means uh, U.S. investors may not be able to invest in that company's stock anymore because it, it it was deemed to have this military ties. So so just to to conclude my part, right? You know, we we have seen the sovereign funds becoming the new venture capitalists. They are creating new unicorns, 
uh, but at the same time, their activities are also leading to profound implications, in, especially in the context of cross-border geopolitics. So I turn to Paul to cover the, the second second half and the uh, most mostly on the, uh, the, 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 the regulatory and complexity side. Paul, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Winston, uh, for, uh, uh, for getting this going. This has been a fascinating uh, story of the rise of these unique investors and their uh, development of their expertise to invest in technology. Well, every good story uh, has to have a villain. Uh, and so that's the role I'm going to play here because the US uh, has been um, reacting strongly uh, to the increased presence of sovereign investors in Silicon Valley and on boards of Silicon Valley companies and so forth. So first, uh, the uh, reaction was centered on repurposing existing tools. Uh, in the US toolkit, there is something called CFIUS, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. It's a somewhat secretive interagency organization headed by Treasury in which uh, other agencies play, let's call it a shadow role. They don't really uh, do anything publicly. Uh, and it, its job is to review foreign direct investment in the United States with an eye to determining whether there is a national security risk. Interestingly, um, it started out, and we'll see this in later slides where we go into more detail, focused on basically weapons technology, uh, but it's expanded recently and in a surprising show of bipartisan uh, harmony uh, during the otherwise rather contentious uh, Trump administration, uh, their Congress uh, empowered CFIUS to expand the definition of national security review to include not only uh, the uh, sort of weapons technology. So you would you would imagine things like um, you know, missile uh, technology, which is traditionally seen as sort of a national security issue, uh, to include uh, a broader array of critical technology, critical infrastructure, and sensitive personal data, uh, which uh, is is a large expansion of the scope of national security, and also very, very vague and imprecise area, uh, which uh, I think intentionally is going to be having a chilling effect on the investment in the United States by uh, foreign um, funds, particularly government backed funds. We're gonna have the next slide. This is an interesting um, uh, story of, of how the existing CFIUS mechanism was retooled and repurposed to move from sort of the traditional weapons uh, focused national security concept to the broader uh, digital uh, realm, which we've talked so much about in the first half of the presentation concerning the interest of this area uh, to venture uh, investors in, and increasingly sovereign funds. So back in, in the Ford administration um, a long time ago, the, uh, uh, the administration uh, was fearful that Congress would uh, through uh, xenophobia uh, arising out of the uh, Arab oil embargo and sort of parochialism uh, block much needed foreign direct investment in the United States. Uh, so uh, an executive order, there was no legislation, was adopted uh, by the Ford administration to set up CFIUS to create a secret uh, way that the government could, uh, the executive branch could vet uh, transactions, investments into Secure, secure areas, national security areas, and be able to say to Congress, listen, we vetted it, this is okay, it's going ahead. Um, <clears throat> and it was all done uh, without uh, much publicity. As time progressed during the 80s, when there was a large Japanese foreign direct investment in the US, it became increasingly politicized, the, the concern about foreign direct investment into the US. And there was concern about Japan overtaking the US in terms of technology and, and manufacturing expertise. At that point, uh, the so-called Exxon, no relation to the company that has two X's, uh, this was a congressman, uh, members of Congress to Exxon and Forio, amended uh, the uh, existing legislation uh, to bring uh, CFIUS more and more under the control of Congress. This trend continued in 1992 when the legislation was further uh, amended to focus on 
foreign government uh, involvement. So it was not just foreign direct investment, but where a government was deemed to be somewhere involved uh, behind the investor, there was an additional level uh, of scrutiny. The, the review process, which is, is set by statute uh, over a specific period of time was in effect doubled where a foreign acquirer was acting on behalf of or owned by uh, a foreign government. And here, sovereign funds that we've been talking about fall strictly within, uh, fall strictly within the, uh, the limitation. And then in 2007, uh, after uh, CFIUS approved the acquisition of a US port by a Middle East backed uh, company, which was, you know, had a government influence in, um, Congress, you know, Raised their, raised their arms and said, enough of this. Uh, you can't just uh, leave this in the executive uh, branch. They're not doing the job. So uh, CFIUS was expanded again. Then this is where the notion of, of uh, national security was stretched a bit to include things like ports, critical infrastructure. But that was clearly just the beginning. Move to the next slide. As you can see, CFIUS permits the president to ultimately to block uh, an acquisition. Uh, a lot of it is done through discouragement and sort of wearing out uh, the patience of the foreign investor and, and, and the vendor as well. Um, we talked in the first slide of my section a little bit about the chilling impact of the broad definitions. Well, frankly, if you are um, you know, Blackstone, uh, for example, and, and forming a consortium, uh, to invest in a U.S. company, you you may think twice uh, about including a foreign government-controlled investor uh, in your group because it might attract attention, and so that has one chilling effect. Another chilling effect is that the target uh, will often say, "Well, you know, we're not going to waste our time talking to sovereign wealth funds because we know we may run into problems uh, and delays with CFIUS even if they don't uh, block the transaction." And so that has the chilling effect. But in addition, there has been an increasing pace of actual direct prohibitions and blockages of deals. They go all through the process, all the way up to the president. And the president says, no, enough of this. A couple of trends are obvious here. One is that the, uh, these blockages are not limited, as you might suppose, uh, to uh, Republican or even the Trump administration, although they picked, up, uh, they picked up under the Trump administration, as you will see. They are bipartisan. Uh, Bush and Obama, uh, before Trump, actually went all the way and blocked uh, transactions. So that's that's one one pattern you see. Uh, another one is uh, you see that increasingly the the transactions are not limited to you know, uh, pure defense related uh, issues. The uh, the first one clearly was, uh, and the second one. Arguably, was it's it's a it was a wind farm, but the wind farm uh, was adjacent to and overlooked uh, a, uh, a secret U.S. Air Force or I guess a naval air, naval air base, and so it had a, a legitimate uh, national security military uh, connection. The rest really are technology, and they are uh, clearly an expansion of national security beyond the pure weapons uh, area with which it was originally conceived. Another trend, uh, in addition to uh, those first two, is that the focus has been on China. Uh, if you look down the list, you'll see uh, China, Beijing, uh, throughout uh, Fujian, throughout the list. Um, the one ex one uh, exception, uh, or apparent exception, is Broadcom's uh, proposed acquisition of Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm is um, a uh, uh, a Singapore-based company, uh, but was targeted for a takeover because of the possibility of its acquisition reducing its R&D budget and therefore leading to an increased uh, superiority and uh, gain by the uh, forces of China's uh, F 5G industry. Next slide. Speaking of the chilling effect, just try to figure out what's covered and what's not covered uh, in terms of national security by reading this slide. This is what um, CFIUS tells us is involved in, uh, in national security and it goes on and on and on. So if you are a US company looking for foreign investors or a startup 
uh, looking to uh, raise money uh, abroad, you may shy away from foreign uh, government controlled entities because of the fear of getting tangled up in an endless uh, CFIUS uh, uh, investigation and review. No need to, uh, uh, there won't be a test at the end of this, but this is just really to, to point these out. Next slide. Just by way of illustration, uh, some of the areas in which uh, national security was claimed as a reason to uh, block or slow down the review uh, were uh, three interesting ones. Money ground, we talked earlier about Ant Financial. Ant Financial uh, was very interested in acquiring Money Grab, which was interested in being acquired uh, by Ant Financial, given how its business was going. The process uh, out of probably uh, an abundance of caution went uh, to CFIUS for review, so everyone could make sure that the government blessed it and it wouldn't be overturned later on. Uh, but it sat there and sat there and sat there. Uh, and although there are statutory time limits, uh, they kept getting extended and extended. And finally, Ant Financial said, that clearly this is not happening. And that the, the consensus at the time was that what was of concern was the personal uh, information concerning MoneyGram's uh, US citizen clients although this was not previously really considered a national security threat. Grindr is a gay dating app, uh, oddly enough, and TikTok, you probably all know about it, the, the short uh, musical, uh, short form video uh, musical app. Both of those, the, the sense is that the personal uh, data and personal information of their clients in the US is something that is at risk. Uh, and therefore has national security implications. Again, this is an expansion that I don't think we would have anticipated before the, uh, the buildup that uh, Winston described in the first half. Um, Grindr is, uh, MoneyGram just died. Uh, Grindr was forced to uh, be divested by the Japanese investor in TikTok, as you've probably seen, is going through the courts right now, I think trying to wait out uh, the Trump administration to see whether uh, the Biden administration will be more favorable to continued Chinese involvement in the ownership. Uh, based on what you've seen in the prior slides, I'm not so sure that will be the case. Next slide. One interesting example is, uh, just by way of amusement, is that you know, history uh, may not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. Uh, there's actually one company, Fair, Fairchild Semiconductor, which was the subject of a uh, withdrawn bid back in the 80s by a Japanese investor, uh, and then uh, another uh, failed bid uh, in the, the last decade by a Chinese investor, both uh, on the basis of uh, national security. Next one. Not only is it CFIUS, uh, but we also have uh, Team Telecom, uh, which is a CFIUS-like organization, uh, which has been brought into the play. So uh, in addition to repurposing existing tools, new tools are being brought into the, into the fray. Next. The US is, is turning around fighting fire with fire, has set up several funds, which uh, in parallel to their Chinese counterparts are intended to uh, foster uh, US competitiveness, particularly in 5G, but in other areas as well. Next slide. Some of the examples of, of major investments by the International Development Finance Corporation, a $60 billion fund, small by the standards we've been talking about, but the US is trying to expand it by partnering with Japan, Australia, maybe even India. Uh, next slide. Then you have something called the Blue Dot Network, which is seemingly US's answer uh, to the Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, in China, where the US is attempting uh, to raise funds uh, to uh, expand its activities uh, of investment in various countries, particularly developing countries, uh, through something called the Blue Dot Network. Uh, when, when I saw this, I wondered, well, you know, Belt and Road is puzzling enough. What is Blue Dot Network? Next slide. It's meant to represent that tiny little dot you see in this, this photo from outer space uh, from the rings of Saturn showing basically that we're all in this together. And I think that's our takeaway lesson here that the US and Chinese economies in particular and investment capital flows are so interconnected that um, unscrambling will be a, a task, although it seems to be something that's being tried. And with that, we're gonna turn it over to questions. Thank you very much. 
Hi. Okay. Well, that was just absolutely fascinating. Thank you both, Paul and Winston. I, I feel, I mean, I do feel like you have just kind of drawn the curtain back for us on how the world really works. I mean, this is stuff that you just don't really read about. Uh, who knew that sovereign funds and governments were playing such a big role in investment markets and really determining who the next unicorns will be? I mean, it's really, it's, it is, I just feel like, okay, this is how it really works. So, so I guess my first question is is a practical one for people who are who are tuned in this morning. Um, tell us this is and this one's for I guess for both of you. Uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about how and why this might matter to people attending this morning's program. So regular people like investors, people doing business with Chinese companies, etc. Why should we even care about this? Yeah, let's let, let me start with the financial sector. Yeah, Dinda. You know, obviously, first of all, you know, for for the capital markets, right? You know, this is a huge capital pool that all the capital markets players need to be aware of. You know, especially for the funds. You know, whether it's venture funds. You know, here we're, today we're mostly talking about venture investing, but uh, uh, for PE funds, for real estate funds, energy funds, anything, right? You know, these guys can be really large ticket uh, LP investors for those funds. So that's one. Um, and number two, uh, for the uh, potential unicorns, right? So the startups that are looking for to become a, a, a unicorn, you know, they can talk to these sovereign funds directly because the sovereign funds are becoming venture capitalists themselves, right? And, and then the third, obviously, is the, uh, is the regulatory implication, you know, which means, you know, if you uh, uh, develop this investment relationship, with these sovereign funds, then you have to think a bit further about that uh, GPLP relationship because it has more uh, government geopart geopolitical uh, implications. And for that, you know, I turn to Paul to cover more. Right, and, and uh, I think the uh, thank you, Winston. I think the uh, the issue that uh, comes up, if uh, for example, we'll just give one example. If you are a U.S. company and you have uh, an offer of uh, substantial investment from a non-US investor, you will want to inform yourself, one, whether there is government money somehow uh, up the chain behind it uh, before you proceed. And if you discover that there is, or there may be, uh, then you want to take certain uh, governance precautions uh, to make sure that you isolate uh, those investors from certain technical information as is now required under the legislation that was uh, adopted. That's just one example. There are lots of other things uh, to be aware of. Okay, so so companies will really want to think twice about whether they want to accept. So uh, it's it's a funny thing where on one hand, it's an incredible opportunity for a company, right? I mean, yes. Winston, you were talking yes. about a $600 million investment in, in one company. In, in DoorDash, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. So you want that money. But on the other hand, you have to worry now, if you're in the United States anyway, you have to worry about, well, if I take any of this money, will that kind of essentially screw me in the future? Um, because they won't be able to, uh, you know, your, your businesses will be limited by CFIUS. Right, and the converse is true. If you're an American investor, you may say, take my money, you won't have any problems. Oh, interesting. Right. Okay. So it plays in lots of different directions. So in reality, will these concerns that you're talking about um, have greater impact on Chinese sovereign investment, sovereign fund investments? Um, Winston, I'm just wondering, since the U.S. is increasingly concerned specifically about the national security issues, you know, vis-a-vis -vis China, does that mean that China's, you know, CIC, et cetera, is more sensitive and, you know, more likely to be targeted? Yes. You know, I think the quick answer is totally, totally yes, right? You know, for any sovereign funds, it, 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 um, it, it becomes a regulatory hurdle. And in particular, when it relates to China, uh, the, the, the regulatory review is, is the most serious, right? And it's not only the Chinese sovereign, sovereign capital, right? In general, the Chinese capital is subject to this uh, CFIUS review, right? So, so in, in Paul's example, Grindr, right, was bought by a Chinese listed company. Uh, uh, MoneyGram was was approached by Alibaba, right? These are not sovereign funds, but they already they are already subject to uh, a strict CFIUS review. So you could imagine that for Chinese sovereign capital, it becomes uh, uh, even more. So so overall, you know, we, we have seen this huge drop of Chinese capital into U.S. venture capital system. You know, like for a lot of the Silicon Valley startups, they used to take Chinese capital 
in the past, uh, whether direct or indirectly, for example, in my case, right, you know, I joined the CIC in 2008. And uh, 2010, I set up a vehicle in Silicon Valley uh, called West Summit Capital to invest in early stage growth capital, uh, growth companies, right? Uh, and you know, that, that, that was, let's say, good old days, right? You know, these days, uh, uh, any Chinese capital into US startups may be subject to strict uh, regulatory review, right? So, so yes, you know, uh, last a year or two, you know, uh, overall we have seen this sharp drop of Chinese capital flow into US startups. Right. Okay. So Winston, just to follow up on that, uh, how have CIC and other Chinese funds adjusted to the current climate for investment in the U.S.? Is there anything they can do about it, or they just have they just completely withdrawn and said we'll focus on other parts of the yeah, world? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To, uh, there, there are two two answers to your to your question. You know, one is certainly there's a drop of uh, deal flow, right? If if people feel there's no chance to get the deal, you know, or like this negotiation will drag on a long time. Then probably people give that up, right? So, so, so that's one part of it. Then another side is, you know, uh, uh, the, the Chinese capital have to adjust their investment strategy. Uh, so, so, for example, just to become more passive, right? To become more passive. So, if so, so, so since Paul was uh, highlighted this TID, technology infrastructure and the data are the most sensitive, then may, then uh, for them to approach those related industries maybe they better go back to their passive investment strategy, go back to becoming a LP right. again, right? right? Put right. money into the US money manager's hand and get a good return without touching the companies directly. Right, but BlackRock also might say, uh, thank you very much, we don't want your money. Oh, well, it, it, it's a bit both. They could say that, but they could say, oh, you know what? We develop a new product for you. Okay. We come up. We come up with a framework that we already discussed in Washington D.C. You know, okay, you see. don't have access to data. You don't have access to the corporate board, and we manage everything. You know, right. just yeah. give us your money. Yeah. But there's yeah. actually some interesting, interesting politics behind this, uh, Dinda, which is uh, when the new CFIUS rules came into place. Uh, clearly, the the fingerprints of private equity are all over it because this type of structure that Winston has just recommended uh, was clearly blessed. Uh, wow. in the uh, in the in the legislation and, wow. and another thing I would I would point out is that um, you know the Singaporeans are very quick to point out no we're not China you know, we have money and we're, we're passive we're willing to come in we're not China and the Canadians uh, have actually lobbied for more favorable tax treatment for their pension funds uh, yeah. sort of seeing the opening um, in uh, as a result of this yeah. regulation again from both of you guys I feel I feel you know once again like Oh my God, this is the way the world really works. You know, when you said, Paul, for example, you can see the fingerprints of the investment banking community or whatever all over the, the regulations coming out of Washington. It's like, okay, this is how it really, this is where the power is really, you know, played. But so another question for you, Winston, before I want to get back, Paul, to you about sort of to expand more on how the US is is responding to all this stuff. Um, because I know you had to kind of rush at the end through your descriptions, but but Winston, I'm really curious, especially since you were inside CIC. So, um, and maybe it's changed in recent years, but from your understanding, to what extent are decisions made based on return on investment versus some kind of national strategic interest? Yeah. You know, CSC was set up as a financial investor, right? You know, it, its main goal was to preserve the value and increase the value of the foreign reserve, right? Uh, so, so in, to some extent, you know, CSC is more like a safe. Uh, you know, it, it, it is a focus on the return of the dollar, right? Uh, just, just, you know, in a more diversified way, uh, comparing to safe's focus on uh, on U.S. Treasury bonds, right? Uh, and then, but you know, at the same time, you, we certainly see there are uh, sovereign funds set up for for uh, for 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 government agenda, like the semiconductor fund, right? And the, and the, uh, Paul mentioned that in the U.S. you have the five G related fund. So so I so I say just as as we always say, every sovereign fund is different, right? Uh, in in the past, this means every country has its own fingerprint uh, on its own sovereign fund. Right. But, in, but in today's world, we mean even for one country, there can be different sovereign funds with different character characteristics. 
so, right? So, so you have to look at each fund in, in, a, in a separate context. So, so that's number one, right? Uh, and the, the flip side of this is uh, when, when the capital, you know, we're still living in capitalism, right? So when the capital is coming from the government, it's inevitable that the fund has some government ties there, right? So, so we, 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 shouldn't, we should not be, we, we should not uh, be, you know, shy away from the reality that the sovereign financing is always as economic as political, right? Uh, but what, what we need is have a open dialogue and find a more balanced approach to, to deal with this tremendous uh, capital pool so that we can get the benefit of the long-term capital, the patient capital of the sovereign uh, funds, and at the same time, uh, find an equi equilibrium to deal with this uh, geopolitics, right? So, yeah. so with that, you know, like uh, the, the book that, uh, you know, myself and Paul put together is really try to start a global dialogue to, to find a balanced approach to these rising new capitalists. Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, uh, so Hank Paulson last night gave a talk and um, he talked about concerns that the sort of, uh, you know, the issue of national security is becoming way too widespread and basically made an argument for tall fences, small gardens, that basically you need to determine what are the national security issues, the technologies that you are truly concerned about and keep right. them within a small garden, protect those, but then not let it, you know, affect everything, uh, everything out there. But I wanted to switch, um, Paul, because I my last question before we open it up to questions from the audience is I think it's just really important for us to understand better what is, is the United States even in the game? What is the United States doing? So explain a little bit more about the Blue Dot Network, the Team Telecom, and what is the United States doing to, if anything, to respond? Tell tell a little bit. Uh, we, we, I mean, uh, we, we talked about sort of the, the negative response, the regulatory response, uh, with yeah. sort of the rare bipartisan unity to sort of review and vet foreign directors. There's also a sort of a, almost a copycat uh, response saying, well, you got funds, we're gonna have funds too. Uh, and that's where something called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, was rebranded as the yep. International Development Finance Corporation, which has seemed to be the, the major policy uh, bank for the United States for uh, the fund for this type of investment. Uh, and the Blue Dot uh, Network is clearly an effort to involve uh, like-minded countries, uh, Japan and Australia, uh, most notably, and I think the prize would be India, in an effort to make investments uh, around the world uh, in an effort to counter what is perceived as the influence of the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's in the game to that extent. In addition, as, as uh, I mentioned and, and Winston called out, the US has dedicated a fund of uh, proceeds from the auction of 5G uh, spectrum to foster R&D uh, in 5G technology in the US. The US doesn't really have uh, a 5G champion like Huawei. Yeah. Um, so there is an effort to put some money into that sector to see if we can develop something. And then the third one uh, that shows up in that chart, which is a little bit out there, and we'll, we'll see whether that survives the demise of the Trump administration, but is the notion that maybe the US should be investing money in, in, in Ericsson and Nokia, uh, the European 5G uh, vehicles, in order that there be a, sort of a Western champion uh, against the, uh, the rise of Huawei in 5G. So that, that's, that's part of it. Yeah. So, okay. But to clarify the number, well, firstly, this has all happened just in the last couple of years, right? The Correct. Yeah. Since Dot, 2018. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the numbers are much smaller than the, than the figures that you see in terms of these vision fund and China's CIC, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, look at look at the size of the of the U.S. trade surplus. I mean, it's a huge negative number uh, versus China, which has a very immense positive number. Uh, and there you see where where the the funding ability lies for for foreign direct investment. So one quick follow up question about mm -hmm. you, you talked about um, I guess the blue dot in particular, kind of going out to in an effort to counter the or to offer a, an alternative to right. Chinese investments in the Belt and Road uh, countries, right. et cetera. So I'm really curious as to what happens on the ground. Do, do, you know, do, why would, uh, you know, if you're in some developing country, I don't know, you're in Africa or wherever it might be, 
why would you say yes to investment from Blue Dot versus investment from a Chinese project or whatever? We you know how does that play out? Well, well, first, if I'm selling my house, I'm really happy that more than one person is interested in it, right. uh, so I can probably get uh, get better uh, terms as a result, just because of there's a market. Uh, okay. Secondly, I think the the fact is that. Uh, the Belt and Road uh, investments have been tapering down. Uh, and so there is more interest in other sources of capital uh, for this sort of thing. And I think, you know, if your interest is, for example, to sell into the U.S. market or to sell into the Chinese market, it may influence which source you go to. So there are, no, there are a number of factors, right, uh, I think, here. The U.S. Um, system uh, has largely been... Uh, more more debt based rather than equity based, so I don't think there's a huge difference uh, with the Chinese approach in that in that respect. It's going to differ from country to country. Right, right, right. Got it. Um, okay. All right. Well, let's let's turn to some questions from the audience, and please, um, I would urge you all, people who are listening in, um, type in your questions. We still have some time, so I see there's a question here from Edgar Cifuentes, who is saying. Is there a reason why the UAE and other Middle East countries having a large sovereign fund are not having unicorns? Um, are there some restrictions on, on that? And in the future years, next years, will, will we see unicorns form? Um, let me see. Yeah, will we see unicorns in the Middle East, from the Middle East competing with the US and China? Yeah, I can, I can start on that one. Uh, interestingly, uh, the UAE has uh, two funds uh, taking two different policy approaches. There's Adia, which is a big passive investor. And then there's something called Mubadala, which actually has people on the ground uh, in, uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley. It has actually uh, invested in a number of, uh, of startups uh, directly and through funds with Silver Lake. One of their goals, and they have created, a, you can read all about this in our book, they've created a, a hub for tech startups uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi in an effort to get something going. Um, there may be lots of questions uh, why uh, the UAE is not uh, a center uh, for tech, uh, but the government is trying to change that. And I think we may see things happening. There are a few uh, unicorns uh, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, ride hailing companies and so forth. Um, it, it'll take time. Yeah, let me add to this, right? Uh, but, but I think this is a great question because it, it brings us to, 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 to another aspect of uh, sovereign funds activities, which is uh, they become domestic financiers. Mm -hmm. You know, like traditionally, we keep seeing like CIC making global investments, right? Uh, uh, so, so, the, so certainly sovereign funds are global investors, but uh, increasingly they also take on um, another mandate, which is to promote domestic economic development. And this is the most obvious in the emerging markets in Middle East, uh, in Africa, uh, and even uh, in Central Asia, like Kazakhstan, these type of countries. Uh -huh. um, so, 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 so actually, you could say their global investing is really driven by the lack of unicorn at home. You know, the, uh, because, uh, for example, UAE, right, to this question, you know, they do not really have the ecosystem uh, to, to have, you know, uh, graduate, graduated entrepreneurs, new talents, and mm -hmm. the, the, the VC ecosystem over there, right? So, what they can do. They say, you know, now the sovereign funds are going to take on this task to build up this ecosystem. And, and one step is to make global investments and make the connection with overseas unicorns, for example, through, through Vision Fund, right? Mubadala is a major investor uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Vision Fund. And the second is they also make domestic investing to create that uh, uh, domestic hub. You know, Paul mentioned, you know, it's called Hub 71 AD. Uh, which, which is like, which in, in very, in many aspects, looks like the industry park like in China. You know, so, so they're learning, right, from the US and China, the two leading innovation centers, and then try to build up something similar in the Middle East. And I, I truly believe UAE wanted to uh, use Hub, uh, to, to develop Hub 71 AD as like the Silicon Valley of Middle East, right? Uh, but who, who is leading this charge? Actually, again, it's the sovereign fund of the UAE. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to follow up on something I think, Winston, you talked about earlier, just because it seems like it sort of highlights the complexity 
um, of the kind of dance between uh, return on investment and the sort of political issues. You mentioned that CIC was, I guess, the original lead investor or one of the early investors in Ant Financial, right? And then Correct. other and then mm -hmm. other sovereign funds came in. At yeah, like the but, National Social Security Fund of China. Yeah. As okay. Well. All right, so so the Chinese inv Chinese government investment was a hugely important, uh, yeah. you know, factor in Ant Financial's growth and success. Mm -hmm. I assume. So, great point, yeah. great point, Linda. And, and actually, so, you can you so, can uh, apply this to other countries. Let's say yeah. emerging markets uh, in Africa, in Middle East, right? You know, uh, they have some capital, but they want to attract more capital. And in those contexts, uh, the, the the domestic sovereign fund actually become a a, a policy tool to attract right. foreign capital. Okay. Right? okay. Yeah, because okay. It, 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 it's a trustworthy co-investor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in okay, Africa, for example. Right, right, yeah. right. But then, what's confusing to me? Yeah. Is then we know that the Chinese government said no to the IPO for Ant right. Financial, right? So mm -hmm. that shows that it's like like the complexity that on one hand you have enormous government investment in this company. Yes. And on the other hand, the government says, no, we're going to hold you back and not let you do that. Right. So talk about that for a second. No, the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a complex story, right? Uh, but you can imagine, you, you can, you can, like a one way to look at this is, is that if you're investing into a, a, a regulatory intensive sector, right. uh, it, it, it's probably good to have some government investor in your, in your uh, cap table. Right. Uh, 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 you know, you, you could say like, uh, you know, in the early years well, of right. I, I internet assume platforms. They have, I assume they would have thought, hey, we're cool, we're protected because we've got a huge investment from CIC, right? Yeah, and then, you know, you, you sort of get to the information channel from the right, government, right? right? Sure. You know, th th these are all like a very positive things, you know, but, but, they, but it can only reach certain level, right? Because there's oh, a separation, God. right? So there's a separation between regulation and uh, investment, even though they are two different pockets yeah, of the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and you know what? That underscores the point that we always try to make at China Institute, which is that China is a very complex place. It's not just one China. There are many <laughs> different branches of the government, et cetera, and they're not necessarily 100% all working together, right? They're, they're, they have different oh, right. and different. Right. You know, I, I think it's true. I think that's not unique to China. You see that right. uh, across the world. I mean, the UAE has two different funds. One is a policy. The other is purely financial. And, you know, neither yeah. one is pure as driven snow in there. Right, the right, right. But I think that in the States, we tend to look, chi look at China with a rather simplistic um, <clears throat> view that it's kind of, oh, the Chinese government has spoken or whatever. And it doesn't really work that way. Yeah. It's much more complicated. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like a Uber China and a DD hailing, right? You know, the for 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 car hailing industry, you also had to deal yeah. with like the Public Security Bureau, you know, the Transportation Ministry, yeah. and, and and the, uh, the 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 financial regulators, right? Because they also yeah. with the deposit, you know, they 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 also have the financial aspect. So 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 you know, to your point, Linda, you know, like for 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 a startup, right? You know, they they are involved since since. The start the tech companies supposedly to break down the barriers of the traditional kind of economic setup. You know, certainly they have to. Uh, they they will have dealings with multiple agencies, yes. government regulators, right? Yeah. So yeah. so uh, to yeah. to get to the sovereign funds investment uh, can help, but it cannot cover you every in every aspect. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, and so I wanted to end with um, a kind of broader question, which is. You know, you both talked about, or Paul, you talked about the vague, intentionally vague aspect of CFIUS regulations, right? Mm -hmm. That that has a ch and that that has a chilling effect on foreign investment in the United States. Um, my question is, I guess, you know, isn't that bad for the United States? I'm sorry, it's a rather simplistic, simplistic question, but limiting foreign investment and and this leads to that question of secure national security. I would love to hear you talk a little, both of you talk a little bit about what is the appropriate balance? You know, what do you, how do you think the United States could strike a good balance um, in terms of what to, you know, how to deal with CFIUS and how moving forward, what would be the best approach? But let me take a shot at that uh, and then and we'll have uh, Winston close. I think it's, it's difficult to tell. I, I think from an investment uh, investor standpoint, probably the, the most important thing is to, to understand how it works. You know, is there a time limit? What's off limits? What's not off limits? 
what what is what is the issue here? I think more than anything else is that Ant Financial comes in, wants to buy a company. Its principal business is sending money from uh, you know non-residents or, or residents of the U.S. back home to Mexico, and suddenly this is a national security issue. Um, you know that that just means that the next deal, someone comes along and says, well. I want to buy a diaper factory. Is that a national security issue? Right, you just right. don't know. So I think I, I don't think it matters as much where the line is drawn as that the line is drawn. So you know what's off limits and what's on limits. That's right. I think you know yeah. investment seeks certainty. I don't that know. That would be my two cents. I don't know. Diaper technology seems pretty important to me. Well, there you have it. Yeah. There you have it. <laughs> yeah. It's what, what, all part of the uh, internet of everything, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, like, you, if what, we focus on TID, you know, let's say data, for example, then uh, th there is still, you know, so many unanswered questions there, right? Yeah, because it's a new territory, it's a new economy. Uh, so, so for example, you know, TikTok is discussion is still ongoing. You know, yes. like what does that mean to divest TikTok from its Chinese parent? Right. right? Uh, uh, so, so right now, you know, the, the term sheet is still outstanding, right? Uh, it's still out there, like being discussed, you know, it does, you know, there's a huge expectation gap between the two sides, right? From the China side, they may feel that, you know, if TikTok, you know, is, is partially owned by US and the data is managed by Oracle, you know, the Chinese side cannot touch it. That's about right, right? But the US side may feel actually we need to take over the whole tech TikTok thing, and we, we're going to manage this U.S. operation of, of, of uh, Chinese spy dance, right? So there's a huge, huge uh, expression gap. So whatever term sheet can come out, it can be a very good precedent for future Chinese companies operating in the U.S., right? So, so as, 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 uh, as, as Paul just said, right, you know, there's, you couldn't really argue where the line is drawn, but if, if a line is drawn, at least you have that line to right. have it as a reference. Right, yeah. gotcha. If you have a roadmap, then it kind of doesn't matter where it leads as long right. as you know how to get to the end. Well, I want to thank you both so much again for pulling the curtain back on, you know, I really feel like, you know, help sharing with us how the world really works and um, talking about these issues on both a kind of high level uh, geopolitical, you know, from that perspective, but also in a very concrete way so that um, people understand what the implications are for actually doing business. So. Wow, what a great program. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, we hope that you will join us again for future business programs and arts and culture programs. We've got one next next Tuesday about, um, about food. We're gonna take travel to Fujian province and uh, talk to a tea producer in Fujian province and have a food expert talk about the food of Fujian as well. So, um, but this has been an amazing business program and thank you both Winston and Paul so much for your brilliant insights. We look thank forward you, to you back. We wanna get you back soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dinda. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Thanks very bye much. Bye, bye now.